Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books live stream. Uh, before I introduce our guest for today, we I'll, uh, just a couple of announcements. On April 20th, a week from today, we were welcome. We are welcoming back Zafiro Trio from Pittsburgh. Their show is called Reconnections. Tina Fagan plays piano. Mary Beth Malek on clarinet, Paula Tuttle on cello, and they will perform Mozart and Beethoven for you on the 20th. Uh, our guest today is named Glenn Longacre. He is a West Virginia native. He graduated from WVU with a BA in history and an MA in public history. He's worked in archives for over 30 years. Glenn is the co-editor of To Battle for God and the Right, the Civil War Letters of Emerson Odike, University of Illinois Press, 2003. And uh, he's here to tell you about a book about the West Virginia Sixth Calvary. And uh, here is Glenn Longacre. Oh, thank you, Sean. And I'd like to thank uh, Sean and the Ohio County Public Library for inviting me to speak with you today. And, and hello to everyone in Wheeling. Uh, as Sean mentioned, I am a native West Virginian. I'm from south of you. Uh, I'm in from, from Webster County, West Virginia. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in Wheeling, but I do remember having a wonderful uh, fish sandwich there at the market many years ago. And it, it's really an honor for me to speak with you today uh, on this nice afternoon because uh, the city of Wheeling figures prominently in a, a couple of the uh, uh, occasions in our story that we're going to be talking about. So we'll get to those in a little while. Uh, I, I first encountered uh, George Holliday in his book On the Plains in 65, probably about 35 years ago, uh, when I was a student employee at the West Virginia and Regional History Center in Morgantown. And I just really kind of became intrigued with the story. Uh, I had never heard of these West Virginians and Ohioans uh, from Southern Ohio who uh, served in the 6th West Virginia and ended up on the plains and in the Rocky Mountains following the Civil War. Uh, I thought it was a very unique story. Uh, Holiday's account, his book is well known actually among Western historians. Uh, you, if, you're, if you study that uh, genre, you'll see his name come up quite a bit. Uh, but it was a story that was largely lost uh, and unknown to uh, the folks back east, and uh, I'm really happy. I have to give a shout out to Ohio University Press uh, for uh, work, their wonderful work in getting the book republished uh, as a documentary editing project. Uh, Holiday's story is also kind of remarkable, uh, besides what they did after the war, uh, in that he was a true boy soldier during the Civil War and afterwards. Uh, we don't have any photographs of Holiday uh, from this uh, time period when he served in the West, but this is a self-portrait uh, that I believe he drew uh, that does appear in his book on the Plains in 65, which was published in 1883. So at least this is what he thought he looked like at that time. Uh, I like the long flowing uh, locks of hair that he's given himself there. And he does say uh, yours and an FCL, uh, Sergeant Holiday, at the bottom of the page, uh, which is um, a, a grand army of the Republic saying uh, fraternity, charity, and loyalty, I believe. Uh, so he was prominent in grand army affairs after the war in southern Ohio and then later when he moved to Tennessee. Uh, there, it's really not known how many uh, boy soldiers who served in the Civil War. Uh, most of the uh, boys were served as drummer boys or stretcher bearers, which were usually non-combatant jobs. Uh, this wasn't the case with Holiday. Uh, he was uh, a combatant during the war. Uh, there was one other soldier in his regiment, one of the regiments that he served in, who was actually 14 years of age, so one year younger than Holiday. Uh, this is uh, the only photograph I've been able to uncover of George Holliday. This was from when he served in the Ohio House of Representatives, representing the Republican Party in 1890, 1891. Uh, but George's parents uh, were James T. and Rebecca Holliday. Uh, his father was a minister and farmer uh, who had been born in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, his mother, Rebecca, was from Southern Ohio, I believe from Adams County. And uh, they resided in Pomeroy, Meigs County, Ohio, which is where George was born in uh, 1847. Uh, in the mid-1850s, George's father uh, packs up the family and they moved to Kansas prior to the war uh, to start a new life there. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons they travel to Kansas is that uh, his father, his George's uncle, uh, Cyrus McCormick, is actually one of the founders of Topeka, Kansas, and one of the founders of the state of Kansas. Uh, so Cyrus and Mary, his wife, have moved out to Kansas in the mid 1850s and they've settled uh, the state and have done quite well. And uh, Cyrus invites his brother uh, James to come out and start a new life with them. Uh, the family moved there in, in approximately 1858 uh, when George was just a young boy. Uh, but things don't go well there in Kansas and Topeka. Uh, there are a lot of droughts. Uh, they, their promises, uh, I feel that James felt that he was owed, didn't come true. Uh, and then uh, when things are not going well at all, the last uh, kind of major event that convinces them that it's not working out is that the mother, Rebecca, dies in June of 1861. And at that point, not long after that, although we don't have a specific date, uh, James uh, returns to Ohio uh, with the family, uh, with George and the rest of the family. Uh, George ends up uh, living with one of his older brothers in uh, Powellsville, Ohio, I believe, in Scioto County. And there is some sort of, you know, it doesn't come out completely, but there is some sort of, uh, I think, uh, uh, bad blood. Uh, or hostility between Cyrus and his brother James. Uh, their mother, Mary, had moved out uh, at that time period, and she does end up dying from uh, cholera, I believe. And uh, there are a few letters that Cyrus writes to his wife, Mary, in which he says that he's not sure that all of his brothers have done what they could do for their mother. Uh, so I'm not sure whether... Uh, uh, they were on good terms when James decided to return to Ohio. Uh, but after their return to Ohio, Holiday uh, enlists in 1863. Uh, they are, the West Virginia units are actually recruiting in Ohio, in Southern Ohio, looking for troops. And he joins the 4th West Virginia Volunteer Cavalry, Company M. And this is just a representative example from the 7th West Virginia. Cavalry that I wanted to show you. Um, George at the time in August 1863 is 15 years old, uh, but his enlistment papers will list him as 18. Uh, his next unit that he will uh, enlist in, uh, basically in the spring of 1864, will be the 5th West Virginia Cavalry. Uh, the 4th was actually a, a one-year regiment, uh, and that was one of the attractive, I think, aspects of that regiment. It was not going to be for the entire course of the war. Uh, but again, George enlists in the 5th West Virginia Cavalry in the spring of 1864. And again, his enlistment papers uh, claim he was 18 years old when he was not. Uh, George finally ends up in the, the 6th West Virginia Veteran Volunteer Cavalry in Company G uh, in late 1864. And again, his papers indicate that he's 18 years old and uh, he's not. <laughs> so there's a little, little prevarication going on there. And I just wanted to give you an idea of where the West Virginia recruit uh, units are recruiting from. Uh, these are some of the regiments that uh, large bodies of Ohioans uh, from Southern Ohio served in. And uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with this area. Uh, but there was a large number of, of men from Southern Ohio who served in West Virginia units for a number of different reasons. Uh, early in the war in 1861 and 62, generally it was because Ohio had filled her quota of troops and basically were turning away entire regiments. And one of the good examples of this is that uh, the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry 
which was raised in the Lawrence uh, County, Ohio area, and uh, consisted to a large degree of just men from uh, that area, from Ohio. Uh, they had uh, volunteered to fight. Uh, they had gone to Columbus and volunteered their services, but had been turned away. And just to give you a little brief background on the 6th West Virginia Veteran Volunteer Cavalry that George serves in, in the end, on the Plains, uh, it's a little complicated. I hope this kind of clears it up a little bit. But these originally were uh, men who served in the 2nd West Virginia Infantry and the 3rd West Virginia Inter Infantry. So they had joined the service in uh, the spring of 1861 as foot soldiers. Uh, then in uh, early 1863, uh, early to mid-1863, the regiments were uh, converted over to mounted infantry. And so you might want to uh, ask the question of what is mounted infantry compared to infantry or cavalry. And it's basically the mode of transportation to the battlefield. Uh, they they will ride a horse. But all of their uh, equipment and armaments, uh, their Springfield muskets and everything, will still be the same. And I've read that the Springfield must uh, was considered quite useless while you're on horseback. So they weren't equipped with carbines or any of those types of equipments that you would normally associate with cavalry units. So the horse for them for that time period was basically to get them to the battlefield. Uh, in 18, in the early 1864, uh, the second West Virginia mounted infantry and the third are converted over to respectively the fifth West Virginia cavalry and the sixth. And the whole reason behind this evolution is because uh, as we're all aware, the mountains in West Virginia make it uh, terribly difficult for foot soldiers to uh, navigate. Uh, the roads are basically uh, full of mud. Uh, they're difficult to, difficult to get through. And what they're chasing uh, and what they're trying to encounter are Confederate cavalry units. And so foot soldiers have a very difficult time of doing that. Uh, finally, in late December, 1864, uh, the 5th and 6th West Virginia Cavalry are converted and consolidated into the 6th West Virginia Veteran Volunteer Cavalry Regiment. Uh, but early in their uh, service, the 1st and 2nd West Virginia, uh, this is just a listing of some of the campaigns that they fought in. And many times they actually fought in the same units side by side in these battles. Uh, they were involved in the battles in Western Virginia early in the war and later in, at Droop Mountain, uh, they served at the Second Battle of Bull Run uh, in 1862. Uh, they served in different aspects of the Shenandoah Valley campaigns uh, in 1862. And then the fifth uh, would actually serve at, uh, at the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain in Virginia in 1864. Uh, but when the fifth and sixth West Virginia Cavalry Regiments, which were now badly depleted in December of eight, in late November of 1864. Uh, they're stationed at a fort called Fort Kelly, uh, which is over near Kaiser, West Virginia. And on November 28th, 1864, General Thomas Rosser, Confederate Cavalry Gen General, has his division, uh, which he uses to surprise the federal force at New Creek. Uh, he captures the entire fort and basically in the West Virginia, the 6th, 5th and 6th West Virginia Cavalry Regiments in mass. Uh, he doesn't capture a holiday. Uh, there is a, a contingent of men under Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, Rufus Fleming, who is the executive officer of the 6th West Virginia. Uh, and they are uh, actually in an engagement the day before with Rosser's men, and they get pushed back. And they warn Colonel George Latham, who's in charge at, at New Creek. Uh, at Fort Kelly that uh, Rosser is advancing. And uh, for some reason, Latham uh, doesn't pay too much attention to their uh, warnings, uh, which is strange. Uh, the next morning, early in the morning, Rosser's men uh, dressed in Union uniforms approach the fort and are uh, passed through the, the sentries. Uh, and they end up capturing the entire fort and basically all of the men and, and some uh, provisions. At that point, uh, the uh, 5th and 6th West Virginia is scattered. Uh, many of the officers are sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, where they'll be held for a few months until they're exchanged. 
Uh, a lot of the men will be spread over prisoner of war camps throughout the South from South Carolina, uh, Virginia, and other states. Uh, so in the spring of 1865, they really began finally kind of filtering back to uh, the, the regiment. Uh, but in uh, December, early December 1864, uh, the two regiments are so badly depleted, it's decided that they should be consolidated, and they're consolidated into the 6th West Virginia Veteran Volunteer Cavalry. Uh, this is the uh, Latham, uh, who was, was actually had been the uh, highest ranking officer, but was also the colonel of the uh, 6th West Virginia, I believe, was court-martialed uh, for his uh, uh, actions at New Creek. Uh, the 6th West Virginia Veteran Volunteer Cavalry will now be under the command of Rufus E. Fleming. Uh, Rufus Fleming started out as an enlisted man, as a sergeant in the 3rd West Virginia Volunteer Infantry, and then later moved up through the 6th West Virginia Cavalry. He's actually uh, the commander who will lead them onto the plains, uh, and he has a rough time doing that because uh, he is wounded severely twice at the Second Battle of Manassas. Uh, in the groin, and uh, I, from what I read from his uh, uh, pension file, uh, the wounds, one, one of the wounds never healed, so he had basically a, a running sore his entire life from that wound. Uh, so that takes us to the spring of 1865. Uh, the 6th West Virginia will be encamped uh, in, uh, in and around the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, they are involved in the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth following the assassination of President Lincoln. Uh, they're not actually in the Grand Review. They provide guard duty along the route uh, for the Grand Review for those two days in May, I believe, when, when that's taking place. Uh, but in June, in early June, they receive their orders uh, when most of them Grand vast majority of men are basically heading home from all the different regiments uh, from the various armies. Uh, the 6th the West Virginia receive orders that they're going to be put on uh, boxcars and they're going to be heading west to guard stations, uh, telegraph stations, mail stations, stage stations along the Oregon Trail. Uh, of course, this is uh, met with a lot of anger uh, and discontent from the men. They thought they were going home. Uh, unlike Holiday, many of these men had served uh, from spring of 1861, so they had done their, their duty. Uh, Holiday, uh, in his book, said he was very excited. He was still only, uh, I think, I believe 16 years old, 17 years old at the time, so he was excited. He had been, of course, in Kansas before, so he had a little experience at that time. And uh, he, he mentions that he was very excited to go, but uh, a large part of the regiment was not. And this is kind of where Holiday's book on the Plains begins. Uh, his first chapter is kind of a recounting of uh, his his reflections on his time in the war. Uh, he doesn't give a lot of detail, but he does really uh, begin in depth with uh, their uh, the receiving of the orders to head west. And just to kind of give you a little idea uh, to kind of set the stage for what's going on. Uh, in the Western, uh, on the frontier. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, many of the regular army troops are sent east uh, for service. Uh, so there are gaps in the areas that are covered out west. And so the army decides to raise volunteer regiments and militias to uh, perform those types of duties. Uh, in many ways, they're ill-fitted for that kind of duty. Um, there are continued uh, white encroachments in the area. There are uh, people who are violating uh, the treaty uh, treaties that have been uh, uh, sealed with the United States and the various Indian tribes. And these come to a head in 18, November 1864 with the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, when basically two regiments of uh, volunteers and militia advanced from uh, Denver, Colorado territory and massacre a large number of Indians on the Sand Creek. I think they kill approximately 160 Native Americans uh, who are there camped peacefully. Uh, that begins a series of events of Indian retaliation for uh, white depredations. Uh, they begin attacking 
uh, isolated posts and raids on military posts, wagons and wagon trains uh, in the area. Uh, there is the town of Julesburg, Colorado, that we'll talk about a little bit uh, in the next few minutes, which is in eastern, northeastern Colorado. Uh, they actually burned that uh, town twice, once in January and once in February 1865. Uh, there is the Battle of Platte Bridge, uh, which will become Fort Casper, and which will be where in July of 1865, uh, which is where Holiday and many of the men from the 6th West Virginia will be uh, stationed uh, for their year on the plains. And the primary tribes that uh, George and the other men from the 6th West Virginia are going to encounter are the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Sioux. But on their way out, uh, to kind of add uh, uh, another blow to their morale. And once I should say, once they begin leaving uh, on train from Washington, DC, uh, many of the men on the 6th West Virginia begin deserting. Uh, so probably over the course of their travels from Washington, DC out to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, approximately 85 men from the regiment deserted on the way out. And there'll be a few that will desert a little after that. Uh, that's kind of why it's hard to keep a, an accurate count of men in the regiment for this time period because of the number of desertions. Uh, but on their way out, so they're traveling by train through Carlisle, Illinois. Uh, it's midnight and they are um, asleep on the train when there's a loud crash and they have a head-on collision with an eastbound train. Uh, what makes this uh, completely uh, horrific is the fact that it is completely dark out. And little to their knowledge is that they're on the middle of a trestle over a river in Carlisle, the Kaskaskia River. So they're about 40 feet, 30 to 40 feet off of the, the ground. They don't realize that. So they throw open the doors on the boxcars and they begin jumping out. Uh, unfortunately, many of them jump and they land 40 feet down into basically what is a swamp, uh, swamp area. And I have some a couple of photographs. Uh, I traveled down several years ago uh, from the Chicago area, and this is the new trestle for the railroad. Uh, but but it is this maybe a couple of hundred yards situated south of uh, the trestle that they they took and were uh, uh, involved in the collision on. This gives you a good idea of what they encountered. Uh, once they discover that they're on the trestle, uh, they begin actually using their rifles to uh, break out the roof and the, the sides of the boxcars. And then they climb over the boxcars down onto the tracks and basically uh, crab walk all the way back to where they finally reach uh, land, the hill. Um, in this accident, uh, there are four men basically from the regiment who were killed. Uh, there are uh, the uh, locomotive uh, engineer and uh, a couple of other men from both trains who were killed in the accident. It was quite a collision. Uh, for the 6th West Virginia, approximately 70 of their horses, uh, which had been uh, uh, in boxcars toward the front of the train, uh, were killed and scattered uh, all the way down into the, the ravine. This is where they're actually heading. And to give you an idea, uh, this is a, a nice map of the Oregon Trail. They're gonna uh, come over and basically they're gonna marshal at Fort Leavenworth. And we're gonna take a look at a couple of maps in a few minutes to kind of bring this into more into focus for you. Uh, the farthest they will go though, will be over into central, more central uh, Colorado territory, Colorado, you see. I wanted to show you this example too. This is uh, a painting by William Henry Jackson from approximately 1931, uh, giving you an idea of the train that they're going to be traveling through to get to their locations. Uh, in the far distance is uh, a spire that you can see kind of in the upper left-hand side there. That's Chimney Rock, uh, which is a well-known landmark along the Oregon Trail. Uh, Jackson himself uh, painted this in 1931 or around there, but he actually had traveled on the trail as a young boy. So finally, the, the 6th West Virginia arrive at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, 
the men are uh, very frustrated, very angry. And so on the morning of July 15th, 1865, uh, they sound boots and saddles uh, for the men uh, to get out of their tents and get ready to move farther west. And the men, I think, at this point realize that this is their last chance if they have any sort of say among themselves in this. And so they do uh, mutiny. So uh, approximately at this point, the regiment has maybe 300 men in it. Uh, it's been very much reduced through uh, combat, uh, mainly through disease, uh, but then also a number of the men deserting on their way out uh, to Kansas. Uh, so uh, they sound boots and saddles. The men, probably two thirds of the regiment, refuse to leave their tents. Uh, this throws uh, the post into an uproar, basically. Uh, this is actually a, a picture from Fort Leavenworth of the first independent color battery uh, from approximately 1864. Uh, I wanted to show you that because uh, this gentleman, uh, Brigadier General Carlos Stahlbrand, who is uh, the acting post commander at Fort Leavenworth, uh, he is incensed. He wants a court martial that uh, he shall convene, which will sentence some of the six West Virginia to be shot. Uh, he basically arrests the entire regiment, uh, along with, um, and I should mention that the six West Virginia is not the only reg regiment involved in this move west. Uh, they're part of what is called the first separate cavalry brigade under a, um, a Brigadier General uh, Tibbetts who have been in charge of the 21st New York Cavalry. Uh, so General Stolbrand will arrest uh, General Tibbetts. He'll arrest Rufus Fleming. He'll arrest all of the uh, regiment's officers and, and basically the entire regiment, put them under arrest. Uh, but what he would like to do uh, also is to train uh, the cannon from the first color battery. Uh, first, I'm sorry, we'll go back for a second. Uh, the first independent color, color battery. He orders them to train their guns on the West Virginia camp. Well, the men in the first uh, independent color battery are unhappy as well. Uh, they're just a few days away from uh, being discharged themselves. Uh, there has been some charges of abuse from their officers. Uh, one of the things that make that unit kind of interesting is that their officers for that time period are indeed uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, which is quite rare, rare in the U.S. military at that time. Uh, Colonel Tibbetts, or Brigadier General Tibbetts, uh, says that uh, they're going to go across the plains if he has to send their dead bodies in ambulances. And so it's a lot going on right now. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fleming uh, makes a speech to the entire regiment, pleading with them to go along. Holliday says that he was crying at the time, trying to get the men uh, to obey orders. Uh, it must be something for your entire regiment, for the most part, to be mutinying on you. Uh, there's uh, a lot of recriminations against uh, between the men and the officers. Uh, the men feel like the officers knew they were uh, ordered west and didn't say anything about it. Uh, some of the men end up actually stealing, which is a, an insult to the regiment. They steal the regimental flags and don't give them back. Uh, there is a court martial uh, in the end. Uh, four men, or three men, are actually uh, sentenced to be shot from the 6th West Virginia, but that's overturned. Uh, they are sent to uh, prison in St. Louis, uh, where they promptly escape, actually, and return back to uh, West Virginia. And one of the men is from the Pittsburgh area, so he returns to uh, Pittsburgh. But while the men are in a mutiny, state of mutiny, uh, that word makes it back to West to Western Virginia, uh, basically, or West Virginia, I'm sorry. And uh, you know, I have to give a shout out to the Wheeling Intelligence. Sure, what a wonderful paper to, to record many of these events that uh, happened to the 6th West Virginia. Uh, and while you know people in West Virginia uh, are can commiserate with the men, uh, they also have to understand that uh, they're not going to condone what they did. And so, as you can see, the editor said, "We all know that the case of the regiment is a hard one, but no amount of sympathy can avail until every vestige of mutiny and insubordination disappears." 
And, and you have to understand, too, that West Virginia, of course, is a brand new state. And uh, this does not look uh, too kindly upon uh, the new state. Uh, the results of the mutiny. Well, the 6th West Virginia will basically be split into two, what some might call, they call demi battalions, or two very small battalions of men who uh, mutinied and those who did not. So when Holiday uh, and the men in the West Virginia, 6th West Virginia who decide not to mutiny, uh, they head west, they move them out of camp. Uh, the regiments basically split into half. So about 150 men in the end decide to march after the colonel's pleas, Lieutenant Colonel Fleming's pleas. So they move outside of camp for a few miles and then set up their own camp. And then Phil Fleming and the other officers are you know, basically remain in Fort Leavenworth under arrest while well, he tries to get the rest of them to move, uh, at least at that point in mid-July, to no avail. Uh, the 6th West Virginia Executive's Officer, Major Andrew Squires, uh, will lead Holiday and the other troopers who, who uh, begrudgingly decide to head west. Uh, uh, he'll lead that contingent. And then Lieutenant Colonel Fleming and the regiment's other company commanders along with about 160 of the men who stay at Fort Leavenworth under arrest, will eventually move uh, later in, uh, I believe, uh, later in the following month, August, uh, they'll depart. Unfortunately, they won't have any horses for them at that point, so many of the men will be walking actually west. Uh, one of the things to kind of remember about campaigning in the west at this time period is that the traditional cavalry uh, horses uh, are not suited for service in the West, uh, they need to be fed grain. Uh, so at Fort Leavenworth, one of the activities that the 6th West Virginia engage in, engages in is turning over their, pon their horses for ponies, uh, which can live off the land. And this will give you uh, an example of the kind of the area of operations that the 6th West Virginia will, will cover uh, over the next several months. Um, you can see they're basically from just west of Fort Kearney there in Nebraska Territory uh, over into uh, northeastern Colorado Territory. We have Julesburg and Fort Sedgwick. Uh, it just basically follows the Platte River, and it does uh, fork there, as you can see. And then uh, the North Platte, which will take them up into uh, Wyoming, uh, which is Fort Laramie and, and uh, Fort Casper. And so it's about 400 miles of trail uh, and uh, stage stations that uh, these uh, approximately 300 men at a certain point will have to guard. Uh, there are units, as I mentioned, out, other units, other volunteer units out there that I mentioned. Uh, for instance, uh, Custer's, General Custer's Cavalry Brigade is out there. They're just as unhappy as the 6th West Virginia. Uh, but 400, 400 miles is a little bit uh, kind of hard to comprehend. Uh, being from West Virginia, uh, I get an idea of this might, I can relate more to this than I can to trying to figure that out. Uh, so it's basically around 438 miles between Charleston and, and Myrtle Beach, where we used to go on vacation all the time. So that kind of get, maybe gives you a better idea of the ground that these men are covering. Uh, as they move out along the Oregon Trail, uh, they do pass a lot of the famous landmarks. Uh, these you can still see today if you uh, follow Interstate 80 and then branch off. And I think it's Route uh, possibly 25 or 26 out there that will actually take you along uh, the same route as the Overland Trail, the Oregon Trail. And these landmarks are still there for you to see. So this is probably the most famous. This is Chimney Rock, uh, which Holiday will write about in his book. Um, This is a courthouse and jail rocks. Uh, both of these uh, landmarks along with Jimmy Rock are in uh, Western Nebraska. And I wanted to give you an idea of some of the stations and posts that the, the men from the 6th West Virginia uh, manned while they were there. Uh, some of the larger posts uh, they were located at was Fort Laramie in Wyoming, uh, Fort McPherson, which actually was post Cottonwood in Nebraska, uh, which was just west of Fort Kearney. Uh, Fort Casper, uh, which was uh, going to be renamed. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. At Flat Bridge, Wyoming. And then at Fort Sedgwick, uh, which was Camp Rankin in northeastern Colorado. And some of the smaller posts, 
that they were located at. Uh, our alkali station in Nebraska Territory, uh, Lillian Springs in Colorado Territory, uh, a place called Labanta, which was on the way from Fort Laramie to Fort Casper, uh, and Deer Creek, uh, the same as that. So some of these are quite small. You may just have uh, 15 to 30 men at one of them. Uh, some of them are much larger. Uh, for instance, at Fort Casper at one point, uh, they'll have approximately 160 men. So some of them can be quite large. Uh, I like to give you an example of Fort Sedgwick, uh, which was originally Camp Rankin near Julesburg. Uh, this is an original drawing from uh, Eugene Ware, who served with the 2nd Iowa Volunteer Cavalry on that, in that area. And what's kind of interesting about this is if you've ever seen uh, the movie Dances with Wolves with Kevin Costner, Costner, most people have seen that. Uh, there's a great scene at the beginning where he um, travels out to uh, what is Fort Sedgwick, uh, which basically looks like a, a bunch of uh, tunnels dug into the side of a, a sod hill. And that's where he stays. And it seems like uh, there is uh, nothing around there for miles and miles and miles. Uh, but actually, uh, that was not entirely true. Uh, you'll see uh, in Colorado Territory, uh, you'll see Julesburg and Fort Sedgwick here. So there actually is uh, the town of Julesburg, which is in within sight of Fort Sedgwick. In fact, when Julesburg is burned in January and February of 65, uh, the town's residents will flock to the fort for protection. Uh, this is just a map showing that uh, some of the posts uh, in uh, Wyoming, Dakota Territory that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, there's Fort Laramie in the lower uh, right. Uh, and then you can follow that up along the North Platte River uh, with Horseshoe Creek. There's Labonta, we just mentioned Deer Creek, and then Platte Bridge, uh, Fort Casper. So Holiday and, and his contingent of men uh, from the 6th West Virginia will actually be spread along this entire line. Uh, and you have to understand, you know, most half of the regiment is still under arrest at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, their other half has arrived out here. And uh, so you know, it's not, you know, particularly you don't have homogenous units or companies here. So you have basically all the men from the entire regiment who decided to march. So you'll have different numbers of men from different companies who are now together and moved out. Uh, once Lieutenant Colonel Fleming and the other company commanders and men move uh, in a couple of months from Fort Leavenworth, uh, they'll be spread along western Nebraska and uh, posts along that area and into uh, Julesburg at Fort Sedgwick and a little east of, or a little west of there at a post called Lillian Springs. Uh, but just to give you a little information about Platte Bridge, where George Holliday and the other men will be, uh, it is the Platte Bridge until July 26, 1865. Uh, we're a little past that. At that point, there is a battle there uh, where we have the death of Lieutenant Caspar Collins uh, with the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. Uh, the 11th Ohio uh, was a, a cavalry regiment formed, and they spent their entire service in the West. Uh, and Collins was the son of the commanding officer of the regiment. Uh, he's actually passing through Fort uh, from uh, Platte Bridge uh, when uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 Indians uh, attack a nearby wagon train. Uh, the men, as you can see in the lower front of that drawing, uh, this is a drawing depicting the battle. Uh, that's the fort at the bottom. Uh, they had no plans to go out. Uh, about 16 men, actually about 30 men, and Collins decided to try a rescue mission uh, for the wagon train, but once they cross the bridge across the Platte River, they get uh, over to the bluffs that you can see there in the middle, upper middle of the screen, and are basically surrounded and cut off. Only a couple of the men uh, escape and make it down to the Platte River where they can get across there. Uh, the rest of the men, including Collins, are killed. Uh, when the 6th West Virginia is there in November 1865, the post will be renamed Fort Casper uh, in his honor. Here's a drawing uh, that's from the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming. It's believed that Casper Collins, who was quite uh, an artist, actually drew this uh, 
created this drawing himself of Platte Bridge. Uh, you can see it's a rather long bridge across the Platte River there. And it's interesting, uh, kind of sad also, the fact that he probably sketched over on the bluffs on the right the, the uh, place of his uh, demise uh, a couple of years later. This is uh, Platte Bridge or Fort Casper today. Uh, it's a state historic site you can go and visit. Uh, this is basically what it looked like when the 6th uh, West Virginia arrived. Uh, the problem is that when they arrive, uh, there's no shelter for them. Uh, they're living in tents. Uh, it's in uh, September, October, and November of 1865, uh, which is going to amount to be a particularly bad winter that year. And they had no shelter there. Uh, so being uh, um, ingenious as they are, uh, that long bridge uh, that we looked at a few moments ago, there's another long bridge similar to this, probably about four or five miles east that crosses the Platte River. And they proceed to that bridge and dismantle it. And they take all that timber back and they use that to build their, their barracks uh, to survive the winter. Uh, following the war, the owner of the bridge will submit a claim uh, to the War Department to be reimbursed for his bridge. And one of the uh, officers from the 6th West Virginia will write an interesting letter detailing uh, what they did with the, with the materials and everything. Um, and so what did the 6th West Virginia do on the Plains in 1865? Uh, well, of course, they had been separated into two different battalions. Uh, they were posted at the various stage and mail stations along the route. Uh, they did escort duty uh, for stage and mail and army wagon trains. And they did conduct some operations against Native Americans in the area. Uh, the problem is that they're going into the winter time and everything's going to really slow down at that point. And their main task basically is to survive the winter. Uh, in December 1865, Holiday is out on a wood gathering mission. Uh, detail with, with uh, several other men from the 6th West Virginia. And he does one of the, the things that you're always not supposed to do when you're taking a trail uh, in an area is he decides to take a shortcut and deviate from the trail. Uh, he sees the fort and decides to take a shortcut. He basically gets caught in a, a deep snow drift and can't get out of it and almost freezes to death. He does suffer frostbite. Uh, they have poor, scant rations. Uh, their biggest enemy there, again, is going to be disease, just as it was throughout the war. And a few of the men actually die uh, to, of scurvy. Uh, wood gathering is always a uh, uh, large undertaking because the nearest wood is six or seven miles away. Uh, so they need wood for heat. Uh, they need wood for shelter. Uh, they need wood to cook with. Uh, so it's a continual process of sending out one or two wagons with 15 to 30 men. Uh, digging their way through two to three feet of snow, uh, six or seven miles to spend a couple of nights loading their wagons up with wood and bring them back to Fort Casper. Uh, this happens, this is a continuing uh, detail that they have to, to uh, accomplish uh, all the time there. Uh, so basically, I think their, their largest task was to survive uh, the winter. Uh, in April, March and April, they do receive orders, uh, sending them back to or consolidating them back at, uh, uh, at Fort or at Post Cottonwood or Fort McPherson, and then they're going to move back as a regiment. And that's the first time they've been a complete or a regiment together uh, since the year before. And they're going to be mustered out at Fort Leavenworth on May 22nd of 1866. Uh, at this point, uh, the regiment returns to Wheeling, where they are. Uh, given a grand reception by the, the, the citizens of the town. And that's in late May of 1866, and they receive their final discharge. Uh, Holiday returns to Ohio, to Southern Ohio, and he settles in the Hanging Rock, uh, Ironton area, and begins, uh, at this point, uh, he's just 18 years old, and he's already a veteran of two wars, the Civil War and the Indian Wars. And he doesn't have an occupation even at this point. Uh, they does settle in the Hanging Rock area, and he takes an entry-level position in a stove industry uh, at, at a stove company called Henderson & Kahn, I believe. Uh, this is actually from a Sanborn fire map from the 1880s when he worked at the Foster Stove Company in that area. Uh, in 1871, 
Uh, he does marry Lucy Shepard from the area. And I've always appreciated the, uh, and have to credit the sense of humor by the minister's parents, uh, ABC, who married them in June 1871 in uh, Scioto County. Uh, they do have five children, uh, Frank, Carl, Merrill, Walter, and Mary. Uh, this is a photo of Lucy from approximately 1890. Uh, this is a photograph of Lucy and Mary from approximately 1933. And uh, their children, uh, uh, one of their children anyway, uh, Carl Holliday, actually becomes a well-known uh, historian and publishes several books. Uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, he's uh, ultimately he's actually killed in an automobile accident uh, in 1937, I believe, uh, but is well known. And what's kind of interesting is that uh, you have a, a family of storytellers. Uh, so basically, you have uh, George's father, who is a minister, uh, George himself, who ends up writing articles for the local newspaper and also his book on the Plains in 65. Uh, his son, Will, will become a, a noted historian, as I mentioned. And then actually Will's son, George H. Holliday, is still living. He's in his uh, late 90s. He lives in Texas. And he becomes a, uh, he's a well-known civil engineer in the field and actually has written a few books himself on the uh, petroleum industry, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but in the late 1870s, uh, George is suffering from uh, his frostbite and from other injuries that he's received during the war, and he applies for a pension. And I think this is probably where he got the idea to, to write down his memoirs and recollections from his year on the plains. And this is what the original book looked like. Uh, it was self-published in 1883. Uh, I think it was published in Wheeling. I don't have an idea of uh, as to who published it or where, that's just my guess, because it does appear uh, in a serialized form in the Wheeling Intelligencer, uh, I believe starting in March of 1883, and then on, uh, on consecutive Tuesdays, I believe, uh, he published uh, the entire book. So I'm not sure whether it was uh, serialized in the paper first and then he published it, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it was probably self-published in Wheeling there. Uh, after the war, he does work hard at the, in the stove industry. He does become actually uh, uh, quite prosperous. Uh, he's involved in filing patents uh, that relate to the stove industry. Uh, while he's in southern Ohio, he even does uh, uh, files a patent with a Charleston businessman, uh, David A. Brawley, uh, for stove patents. Probably the zenith of, of Holiday's career, besides his military service, is the fact that the, he does run as a Republican representative and wins and serves one term in the Ohio legislature. Uh, in 1898, 1899, Holiday and Lucy and their children moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. Again, I think to follow his interests in the stove the manufacturing industry. Although I'm not sure how that works out, he does show up as a surveyor of customs at the Customs House in Knoxville in 1911. Uh, and then the federal census records for 1900, 1910, uh, 19, uh, uh, 1910 show him in various occupations. Uh, city directories have him listed as uh, uh, being involved in real estate with one of his sons. Uh, he does remain in uh, um, active in GAR affairs in Ohio or in uh, Tennessee, excuse me. And then in June of 1919, uh, he passes away. He becomes ill actually in spring of that year uh, and then lingers until June. Uh, and he is buried in the uh, National Cemetery in Knoxville. Uh, this is his obituary. Uh, it does say Captain Holiday, but I believe that was his honorary rank uh, at the McKinley Post of the GAR in Knoxville. And that's just to kind of give you a brief uh, overview of uh, George and his book on the Plains in 65. I did want to mention one thing to you before we uh, take questions here is uh, one of the things I'd kind of like to advocate, and I, I can't think of a better group to do it to uh, except for uh, residents of Wheeling, is that uh, we do need in West Virginia some sort of a, a statehood uh, documentary editing project 
where uh, we have a team of uh, historians who uh, select records, uh, track records down, make decisions on what should be uh, included. And uh, this should be a, a multi-year project to basically publish all of these documents and how they relate to uh, West Virginia statehood. And I hope that's something that can come along in the next few years. Uh, there are a lot of neighboring states that already have programs like that. Uh, we're the only state that was born of the Civil War, basically, and uh, I think it would be a wonderful project for our state. Uh, but that's the, the end of my presentation, and I, I appreciate you uh, spending your, your hour with me. And, and if we have any questions, we'll try to answer them. Well, thank you, Glenn. Very interesting. Um, uh, we had a lot of comments from people saying uh, that they, they weren't aware of this or that it was a new, uh, for example, this one. Yeah, that, that was what, uh, when I ran onto it as a student at West Virginia University, I'd never heard of this. And a, uh, uh, several years ago, I was doing research in West Virginia and one of the, uh, I guess, leading historians for the state uh, was actually surprised when I mentioned it to him. So I thought, okay, well, not many people have heard of this then. Uh, we had a, I'll put this one up, it's rather long, but I'll let you read it. Talking about a Moundsville. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I would say, you know, the, uh, one of the things I didn't mention was that the, uh, uh, the uh, compiled service records for all of the West Virginia men are now online free of charge. Uh, in the past, you had to uh, uh, have a subscription to Fold3 or something along those lines uh, to gain access to those now, but they're now actually all in the National Archives online catalog uh, for free, so you can access all of those there. Um, did this regiment, the 6th, have uh, reunions or did they have a veterans association or anything that you know of? Uh, they did. Uh, I haven't found too much of an evidence of it, but I, I'm pretty sure that they did have an organization. Uh, Holiday, when he's uh, living in Southern Ohio, does keep in contact with many of the men uh, who served with him in the West. Uh, so I think he did. Uh, I think informally they were all from the same area. Uh, so I'm sure they, they got together as, as an organized party. Uh, he also made several trips to Charleston, uh, uh, where a number of the men in that area were living at the time, uh, and he kept in touch with them. There's one uh, newspaper account that he published in the Ironton uh, uh, newspaper in which he travels to Grafton uh, in the late 1880s and meets with, uh, uh, there was the regimental surgeon who's living there, uh, Dr. Thayer, and then also uh, his lieutenant from uh, the 6th West Virginia, Lieutenant Donahoe, who was living in Grafton at the time and is involved in the lumber business. And he does go to see them and spend some time there. And I think that was for him uh, uh, an interesting time because, you know, the last time he had seen them, he was a boy of, of 18, basically. And I think he went back as a prosperous uh, businessman and wanted to kind of show them that he had succeeded in life. Yeah. Uh, you probably are aware of that the GAR post here in Wheeling was the Holiday Post. I don't know if the, uh, John Holiday was named after was any relative of his. And there was Lydia Holiday, his mother, who was a nurse oh. at, at an advanced age in the Civil War, uh, served as a nurse. And um, just kind of an interesting coincidence, maybe. Uh, you mentioned the... Uh, Statehood papers. Are there any other regiments from West Virginia or subjects that you think are deserving of modern treatment? Uh, well, you know, people say that uh, you know they can't imagine anything else being published on the Civil War that it's all been done. But I think West Virginia uh, uh, has uh, really kind of defies that kind of thinking. Uh, there's the whole issue we talked about earlier of the men who volunteered to serve in, from Southern Ohio in West Virginia units. And there's been nothing written about that at all, uh, just very little bit, a uh, chapter here or a chapter there in a book. Uh, but they have the 
the kind of the main idea is that uh, these regiments were formed because uh, Ohio or the, the same thing happened in Pennsylvania. There were a number of men from the uh, Washington County from uh, the Pittsburgh area who served in uh, West Virginia regiments as well. And that certainly at the beginning of the war sounds plausible uh, that uh, they were turned down by their respective states because their quotas have been filled. Uh, but it doesn't explain uh, the uh, recruiting of the West Virginia uh, regiments in Southern Ohio in, in 1863. So I think there's a lot more work to be done there. Okay. And uh, tell people again how they can get your book if they're interested. I put the website URL at the bottom there for Oh, actually, you can go to the uh, Ohio University uh, Press website and then purchase one there. Uh, or uh, it's available uh, from Amazon.com as well. Okay. Glenn, thank you very much for taking the time today to talk to us. Very interesting subject. And I uh, want to thank everyone who attended, and we'll see you next week for Zafiro Trio and some classical music. Goodbye, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Glenn.